Welcome everybody to the VG5. My name is Citanium. On the show today, we talk about narrative games. It's actually a style of video games that's been around for a long time, but many of us are just now getting familiar with them. Primarily focused on story and atmosphere with very little mechanics and gameplay, narrative games, or walking simulators as I have heard them referred to in the past, are more of a book you play rather than a game. And they are definitely not for everyone. Some gamers may find them to be a good palate cleanser between your bigger titles. For instance, if you just got done with Fallout 4, maybe you're planning on jumping into Destiny 2, well, you might try taking a beat and uh, test out one of these games instead. Note that I am not calling these the best in their genre, as I have not played every game in the genre, and I give them to you in no particular order. My criteria is based on that I have played them. Uh, I consider them a narrative game, and I enjoyed them. Also note that they are short, and I recommend trying to find them on sale if you're not sure it's something you'll like. I played a few of them for just that reason. And now, my five. Our first game is Gone Home for the PS4, Xbox One, and PC from the Fulbright Company. It's 1995, and Katie Greenbrier comes home from her time abroad planning to be greeted by her sister Sam, only to find the house vacant. Her parents are on a second honeymoon of sorts, and her sister has left a note on the door asking her not to investigate the reason she is no longer there. So, what do you do? Investigate why she's not there. Gone Home involves a lot of walking around an empty house, looking through dressers and cabinets. I know, it's riveting, but you start to find notes and trigger voiced journal entries from Sam that explains what has happened. And as Katie uncovers the story around Sam and her friend... <clears throat> Lonnie, you also get a sense of who Katie is and their parents by extension. This is not really a scary game, but the atmosphere of an empty house that's half moved into and tales of your dead uncle's ghost hanging around the place make it feel creepy. I often found myself turning around expecting something to jump out at me, but no, nothing there. There was one startling moment, but you might not even come across it unless you attempt to unlock the cat journal entry. Yeah, you heard me. This is not a long game. Even taking your time, you'll get to the end inside two hours. Let me put it to you this way. There's an achievement if you finish the game in under one minute. You heard that correct. It is possible to play through the game in under a minute. Length is not a high priority here. But they do have some options like commentary and optional modes that can add to the time frame. I didn't end up doing any of that. Once I finished the story, I much preferred to sit with it rather than diving back in. That's actually a comment I can make on all these games on the list. You really want to walk away with the experience more than anything. Overall, Gone Home succeeds on story and atmosphere. The voice acting is minimal but very good, and it tells an interesting story about family, love, personal identity, and sisterhood that would be difficult to deliver in another medium. Our second game is Oxenfree, available on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Switch, and the PC from Night School Studios. Alex and her friends head off to a local island after hours when everyone has gone home for the night, but their plans for a lonely fireside night of frivolity quickly dissolve as strange things start happening revolving around piles of rocks and the frequency of your handy radio. Soon you get pulled into a plot involving strange rifts, time loops, an abandoned military base, and ghosts from a submarine lost at sea decades before. The game uses a 2.5D style, third-person perspective, and has a cartoony look, but not Saturday morning cartoony, just stylized. The camera often pans wide so the characters look small against the backdrop, and all this works well. When some of the creepier aspects of the game start to reveal themselves, it's definitely got its what-the-hell-is-going-on moments, and it makes it work. Oxenfree is defined as a walk and talk. In fact, besides your walking controls, your basic mechanics are choosing dialogue options with the other characters and searching for journal pages, anomaly spots, etc. However, it does make your dialogue choices matter, and since the story sort of wraps in on itself, you can play the New Game Plus option and try to make further changes to the timeline. And that's good because, again, this island adventure is... <laughs> About a three-hour tour. Sorry, I had to do that. But with New Game Plus and commentary options, you could pad that out easily, especially because all the characters can experience different outcomes through the game and the second playthrough. And while it has some supernatural elements to it, Oxenfree is ultimately a personal story about a girl dealing with her brother's death and the new situation she is in. 
Her relationships to the other characters and what ultimately happens to them is predicated on the dialogue choices you make, and therefore, you have personal investment in the story. Our third game is Firewatch for the PS4, Xbox One, and PC from Campo Santo. Following the Yellowstone fires of 1988, Shoshone National Forest needed a new fire lookout, and Henry was happy to take the job. In fact, the seclusion was a big selling point. Through a series of text-based narrative choices at the beginning of the game, you uncover that Henry's wife Julia has early-onset dementia. She needed special care, their relationship became strained, he was likely going to have a nervous breakdown, and on that cheery note, Firewatch starts in earnest. The story really revolves around Henry's relationship with his superior, Delilah, who he can only communicate with over a walkie-talkie. At first it's all about learning the job, but then some strange things start happening and a mystery long buried rises to the surface. Gameplay is minimal, but definitely there. You climb up rock faces and chop through brush, you investigate abandoned campsites and clean up the trash of inconsiderate teenagers. Grr. But it's all in service to the story, which proves both humorous and suspenseful. What the game does best is setting. For an independent game, it does a great job with production. It looks great, and it sounds great. They used a graphic style that reminded me a little of Borderlands, but placed in the forests of Wyoming. The score music works well, too, and the voice acting from Rich Summer and Sissy Jones is terrific, especially considering conversations between the two dominate the narrative. The game is short. You see a pattern here? I actually hit a game-ending bug that trapped me outside the playable area. I spent more time trying to get out of that glitch than it eventually took me to restart the game and get back to that point in the story. You can complete the whole thing in around two hours. You might take longer to look at the scenery and such, but still. Also, there is a commentary option and a free roam mode once you complete the game if you just want to tour around the woods. Granted, this is not exactly an open-world game. You have pathways you can follow and certain routes you can take to an objective, but it's a nice addition. Overall, though, Firewatch features characters that have realistic problems and a deeper mystery that can really get to you when it's uncovered. This was Campo Santos's first game, and you can tell they made every effort to build something special. Our fourth game is Dear Esther for the PS3, Xbox One, and PC from the Chinese Room. Who doesn't enjoy walking around an uninhabited island listening to an anonymous man read letters to his dead wife? So, yeah, that's basically the entire summary of the game, but let's not judge it solely on that sentence. Dear Esther puts you in the shoes of an unidentified person, walking through the rundown buildings and steep stone steps of an island in the Hebrides. As you travel through the island, you trigger voice fragments from a man writing to his wife, Esther, who died in a car accident. Many things are left shrouded in mystery. Who was responsible for Esther's death? Who is Donnelly and Paul and Jacobson? Is one of them the narrator himself? What happened to him after he arrived on the island? The roles of these characters get continuously blurred as the story progresses, and even start to blend together as it weaves a narrative. If there were ever a true walking simulator, though, this is it. Your entire control scheme is walking, looking, and some zooming in, but only if you want to. Apparently, there are four urns to find, but I have no idea where they would be. Most of the time, I found myself going into these vacant buildings around the island, expecting to find some trinkets or documents. But Bethesda games have spoiled me, and all I found were interiors to walk through, occasionally triggering a narrative moment. But this is not that kind of game. You're supposed to get wrapped up in the experience and not the gameplay. You're kind of forced to because of the nature of this game. I have to give them credit for the visuals, though, especially the caves. Every frame looked like a painting. And while the game is under two hours long, they do a great job weaving a narrative you want to uncover in that time. And by the end, even though you may have many questions that are left unanswered, you will feel something from the experience you just had. And finally, The Unfinished Swan for PS3 and PS4 from Giant Sparrow. I almost feel like I'm cheating with this last one, as The Unfinished Swan does include some gameplay, but the gameplay mostly revolves around throwing balls of ink. It's an art game, literally. You play a boy named Monroe who is chasing after a swan that has escaped a painting. The game starts you out in a completely white space, and then you throw a ball of black ink, and a picture starts taking shape. You see an archway and a cobblestone road. You throw another, and before you is a pond. 
filled with lily pads. A bullfrog jumps across the road and dies under the water. This is a game that's really a painting, and as the player, you are the artist. As Munro moves through the landscape, you learn the story of a lonely king. It helps that the king is voiced by Terry Gilliam. But regardless, the general thought of Unfinished Swan is to be an interactive storybook. You will occasionally have to push back mean ink creatures or traverse tricky terrain, but your main focus is to wander through a children's story that holds some deeper meanings to the grown-ups out there, especially when you get to the end. The last chapter is basically all walking forward, but it brings a genuine sense of heart to close out the story. The graphics are truly unique. It was completely fresh in 2014 and hasn't really been copied since. Giant Sparrow did make a second game called What Remains of Edith Finch, although I have not played that one yet. What I do know is that it's graphically very different from this game. It's got some side objectives that help with length, and it stands around four hours depending on what you do with it, but if you can appreciate the originality it brings to the table, Unfinished Swan will deliver. And I can't go into narrative games without making mention of Telltale games. So far, I have personally played Tales from the Borderlands, The Wolf Among Us, Batman, Walking Dead Season 1 and 2, as well as some of their earlier works like Jurassic Park and Back to the Future. True, these are not exactly narrative games, but they have a strong narrative focus. And if we want to be technical, the Wikipedia listing for Walking Dead describes it as... <clears throat> An episodic, interactive, drama-graphic, adventure-survival-horror video game. Yeah, so basically labels have lost all meaning, but that doesn't stop the company from producing quality story-based games that feature a strong cause and effect dynamic. And it's so much fun to make choices in a game and then see how many other people made that same choice when you reach the end of an episode. They are also some of the few games where I made a choice from a personal perspective in the moment rather than thinking of the long-term consequences. Specifically, there was a moment in Walking Dead Season 1, Episode 2 on a farm with a pitchfork, and there were a couple conflicts in The Wolf Among Us where the big bad wolf got the better of me. Grrr. It takes a lot for a game to make you invest so fully in its story that you act out of instinct rather than strategy. It's usually hard to classify these kinds of games because many AAA titles also feature great storylines. At the same time, they bring complex gameplay, engrossing worlds, and ample playtime to the mix. I could practically make a video on that by itself. But you're better off trying to equate these games to movies you play because essentially that's what they were made to be. And under the right lens, with the right headspace, you can find a game that you remember long after you've eliminated all the demons and zombies and aliens the big titles can throw at you. Thank you for listening.